Hello, hello. Welcome to the first uh, technical session of the afternoon. I hope everyone had a good lunch, or if you're watching this on the internet, I hope you had a good break uh, after the keynote. Uh, we have uh, three very good speakers uh, for the next session, for the next 90 minutes. Each of them will have half an hour of time. There's a slight change in the schedule as, uh, as print. Places. So our first speaker during this session is Addison, who is going to talk to us about white space and interesting uses of the spectrum. Um, Addison, you want to come up and present? Um, just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions, please line up at the microphones so that people on the internet can hear your questions too. Uh, thank you, Philip, for introduction. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adi Sol, Lersim Saptawi. So I'm a researcher at Interlab AIT. Um, it's my great honor to be here, actually, so, and especially for to, uh, and also sharing the session with Jeff Houston. So this is make me a bit nervous today. <laughs> uh, so uh, today, the topic of my talk is going to be the Darknet, a community-wide white space. So this is kind of a research project that we keep doing uh, for some time. And then we just want to highlight that some kind of uh, potential use cases that how can we use TV white space for another uh, for the good things. Okay, uh, let me give a bit introduction. I think all of you attend the keynote uh, session, right? So uh, Professor Kanjan also mentioned about our project, which is called uh, Darknet and Net to Homes. So actually, uh, this project start from 2013. So the concept is that we try to provide the last meter access solution with, uh, to provide internet connectivity to the people who live in the rural areas and with affordable costs. So we start the project from 2013 uh, to kind of the volunteer base. With, uh, we're getting help from the TNG camps where we have uh, the undergrads and young uh, researcher, young engineer, helping us in terms of department and helping us to measure the signal and decided to bring the internet to, uh, to the rural areas. So, uh, and so far, we keep running the projects almost uh, seven years already, and this is our seventh uh, anniversary. So, as you can see from the, the graph, I'm sh showing some kind of statistic that we keep expanding the network. So, to teach in GCAM, we uh, uh, we can, the camp is just organizing well, once a year, and then the number of villages that we can export is about uh, just one village per year. And then later on, in 2017, uh, the project was quite successful, and then we decided to make it more sustained, and so uh, we spin out the project to be uh, kind of the social enterprise company called Net to Home, and since then, we try to engage with the local people, right? We train the local engineers to be, uh, to helping us in terms of monitoring and in helping us in terms of deployment. And so far, uh, we have a good rate to see that. So in 2017, we have six villages to be deployed, and 2018, we have seven, and so this year, we have about four up to now. So in total, we have already deployed about 21 remote, uh, remote communities, and with the active node, which is a louder, a wireless louder, about 200, um, more than 200 nodes, and then uh, we have more than thousands uh, less than users you keeping using our uh, network on a day-to-day -day basis. So let me touch a little bit for the, I think the, uh, this one is not, oh. Uh, I think the demo is not working here. Yeah. Ah, okay, it's working. It's back. So uh, this is uh, what we have developed uh, uh, in during this project. So at Interlab, we develop our own firmware called Dumbo, which allows uh, to turn the uh, the community routers to be a wireless mesh network. And with solution for Darknet, so each village we have to sh we can share the internet connection to the fibers or ADSL. So and those this is the, uh, the equipment that we use. So and on the head, on the on the below, we use the last few ties as well to run some kind of a local application or services like uh, we have the traffic monitoring, we have video on demand application, we also have some kind of chat messages, and we use some kind of DIY a walk, it's like a cooking pan to extend our signal. So, uh, Darknet is going so good with our technology with Wi-Fi, but. A couple of years later on, we found some problem, and it's a classic one about network coverage. As we know, we use a Wi-Fi, so we have some kind of 
uh, some uh, obstacles to expand our network coverage. So uh, this is uh, taking examples from one of the, uh, our network. So uh, actually, the yellow square there is showing our, the, uh, our network coverage with the Wi-Fi router that we deploy. But however, as you can see, uh, some of the less circle here, this is like there is a half there, and then uh, they, uh, the villagers want to use our network as well. But with the barnacles, uh, we cannot expand, extend our coverage here because of, as you can see, we have some kind of, this is our real situations. We have a lot of trees, of obstacles to blocking the door six now. So we could not find any kind of number of sites. And of, of course, uh, we cannot extend the multi-hops as well. As we know from experiments, we have maximum can extend of, of just only three hops. So uh, we look aloud to the solution. How can we uh, conquer or solve that problem? And we found that TY space should be one of them, to be the good solution. TY space is, uh, is a concept to use the, uh, the TV channel, TV frequencies, to operate the broadband connectivity. So as we can see, the TY space is running over uh, the frequency band between 400 uh, for two seven hundred. So in that one, we have the strong characteristics of the uh, of the uh, in the, uh, penetrations. So the wide spread, we don't need uh, the light of sight, and also it can support the long distance as well, like up to ten to twelve kilometers. And also it can support point to point communication. One base station can support up to uh, twelve or even more right now. So this is can be the lower cost of the department. And also the policy is to use the white space is very really simple. So into white space, because we have to share the spectrum with the, uh, the TV channel, which is we call the licensed user, who pay for the license for the TV band, like the TV broadcasting. So as we can see, uh, the back bar here showing the signal, which is occupied by the licensed users, and then the white one, this is our white space, which means, so this is no one, not, uh, the spectrum is not being used by anyone. So we can use our equipment to deploy and use this frequency to operate another purpose. So uh, from 2017, 2019, we are lucky to get the support, research funding from uh, NBTC, which is our Thai regulators. So the project is keep, uh, keep running for two years, and then we just finished it recently, uh, early this year. So, uh, so this project, the, the goals of this project, we try to demonstrate that how can we use TVY space to do the trials, and then we can claim that this is our first trial TVY space in Thailand. And also the second objective is to, uh, we have to, uh, we want to explore what kind of TV uh, white space that we can use uh, during the project. And of course, uh, the, another parallel that we got apart from the research funding is about, we got the license to run and, and to make this project come to. So we got a license from 470 megahertz to uh, 790s. So first of all, when we first run the project, we don't have any clue about how many white space that we have what which frequency we can use to avoid making interference to the license, uh, to the, uh, the license user. We first do this, uh, run the campaign called Spectrum Measurement. Uh, we try to, uh, this is our equipment. So the equipment is quite be, uh, low cost. We use spect a low cost spectrum analyzer called IOS Explorer, which is cost about 5,000 baht. And then we get support from ICTP, which is the delisters lab from Italy. So helping us uh, to, uh, to develop the tools to, uh, to record the spectrum uh, and uh, to get, together with the GPS locations as well. And this is our measurement that we do. Uh, we have, like, like we, uh, we're focusing on the frequency band, which is the TV band in Thailand, 510 to 700 IDs. And then uh, we looking to the location between low, uh, outdoor and indoors. And also, we also considering the factors of uh, the heights of the nights as well. So the trials, as I mentioned, so, uh, the use cases that we want to demonstrate to use the device space is try to provide a broadband internet at in darknet, as I mentioned before. So, and those is a location that we planned to deploy. The first one here, this is uh, the public school that we have the fiber optic internet connections, and we want to deploy the base station there. And then here, this is the uh, this, the village called M9 which is a bit, a bit about uh, one kilometer far away from the base station. And then we have second location, which is M1, which is about uh, 600, uh, 700 meters. And then we have another far right there, it's about uh, two, uh, two or two, three kilometers. So, and also, we also have the, uh, the LTE small cells to provide access, uh, to the use, uh, access to the users as well here in this location. 
So uh, as I mentioned, so we do the measurement. The first measurement about we call that mobile measurement in order to exporting that what, how much frequency that we have that that we can use. So as we can see, this is a map around that location. Oh, sorry, around that location here. So we put the mobile phones with and uh, with the uh, F Explorer and run experiment on the car to explore the frequency as we can show here. So the green bar is showing like uh, the percentage of the uh, the the percentage of the, uh, the spectrum that uh, is, is free. So from the result that we showed, we found that more than 80% of the received signal power have really low powers, which is less than uh, the threshold, which is 100, minus 100 dBm. So which means that most of them are free that we can use. But just a minute. So that one is just exploring the vast areas of the, uh, the location of the spectrum. We also do the static measurements as well to make sure that the location, each location that we want to deploy the equipment are not, uh, the frequency are, are, are completely free. So this is, we call the static measurement. So we set up like, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the devices like that and keep running the experiment for two or three hours at least for several measurements to, to find out which, which amount is free. And, and here, this is the result from the, uh, the commercial spectrum analyzer, which is a key size elegant. So we found that we compared the result, and both of them have the same result. We found that only five channels are being used in, in those areas. So, and this is our result, or the summaries. So this is, we do some, uh, we, we compare the, uh, the three channels as well. The first one from AIT campus, which is the 40, 45 kilometer from Bangkok, we have about 28 channels, which is free. And then for Darknet, in the dark location, we have about 30 channels, which is free. So for the deployment, so uh, now we know that which frequency that we can use. So we deployed, uh, we set up the base station here at the school uh, with the internet connection here, and we set up the the, uh, the three location here with the the the, list, the, uh, the client of the TV TV space equipment. So we call M9, M1, and M10. So from these, we demonstrate two uh, three use cases. The first use case, we try to integrate the TY space backhaul as a last mile access to the uh, the existing. A computer network called Darknet. So in this one, in these use cases, uh, we use the device space as a second, uh, second internet gateway to access the internet. And then the second village called M1, we use, we integrated with the LTE uh, small cell, which is uh, running over device space as well, which is the frequency that we use from uh, around on 700 megahertz band. And then we also do have like my files, so like a pocket of Wi-Fi to operate or provide the, the Wi-Fi signal to the end users. And the last one is another use case because this village is quite far away and then it's quite isolated earlier. So we set up the use case that we put the public Wi-Fi for the person who passing by and use, we can use the access to internet. So, and this is our installation. So on the photo on the right hand side, this is a tower station that we put the base station. So here, uh, the height is about 24 meters. We calculate by considering the, uh, the fresnel zones. And then we put like a three uh, a wireless sex, uh, antenna sector there to provide the three for the uh, communication to connect it to the CPE. And then this is the examples that we put uh, on, on the, the blue box here is showing the uh, TUI space equipment to receive the signal. And then here, this is LTE. Uh, just out these small cells. And this is our antennas at the receiver size. So the antenna high is about, the pole is about 10 meters. So uh, in terms of performance, uh, the first parameter that we want to uh, measure is about bandwidth. So the bandwidth for three locations, uh, we set up the, the, uh, the, the experiment by using iPerf in order to measuring what could be the uplink speed and download speed. And then this is the, uh, the result that we have. So the maximum bandwidth that we could achieve, which is the, the, loc the closest location, which is, M, uh, which is M1. So the, uh, the bandwidth is about uh, 12 megabit per second maximum. So compared to the, uh, the optimum case, which is putting the cable, so, so we got about 15. So this is quite OK, I think. And uh, from the result, we found that uh, the performance is quite sensitive to the distance. So actually, we are not quite happy with that, because uh, as you can see, uh, from uh, from uh, five, uh, half kilometers, we got about 12, 12 megabit per second, and then uh, uh, the bandwidth is uh, gradually dropped to a 10 megabit per second when we have deployed at one kilometers, and then about two kilometers, we got the achievable bandwidth, which is only 3.5. 
So the second parameters that we want to measure is called RTTs or latencies and also packet loss as well. We do kind of simple ping application to send uh, the ping message to, uh, to, to the gateway, to the, uh, to the uh, TV by switch base station. So uh, we tried increasing the size of the bandwidth, uh, the, the payload, sorry, from 32 to 512 and then 1,500 bytes. So the distance, we found that the distance is not much impact on the RTT. We can see that for each location, for each payload site, so the RTT is quite similar for, for different locations. But uh, the packet loss is quite matters because when we increase the payload site, to uh, one, uh, the maximum one, 1,500 bytes. So uh, the packet lot is increasing uh, significantly. So, uh, and from these trials, I would like to summarize. A bit. This is my key takeaway. So the first key takeaway is about the potential that how can we use the device space. So from our measurements and from observation, so we found that uh, there's TV, uh, TV channel is quite underutilized. Even though in the urban areas and also rural areas, in the urban areas, we found that we know that now today we less and less user watching the TV broadcasting. So everyone uh, turned to watching the, the contents online, like Netflix, uh, Netflix or Amazon or Google's. So and also for the rural area, it's different case. The user still watching the TV broadcasting, but we found that there is not much TV broadcasting station in those areas. So, in summary, in conclusion, so the TV, TV channel is still free that we can use for another purpose. And apart from our project that we run, uh, try to use TV space to connect the the people who live in the undeserved area, we look allow that we have so many successful cases as well in many countries. Like for example, in South Africa, so the regulators are granted to use the TV wide space for the, uh, the local ISP to run legally. And then for the United Kingdom, UK, and we, uh, in, in the northern part of UK, like in the Scotland, so where they have the geophysical barriers that like, like the lake that we can see, that one is some example, the, uh, the Lock Stephen. So it's quite impossible to provide the cable with the fiber optic. So TY space is a case to, to, so, uh, to provide the internet coding in that one. So for the Singapore one, which is close to us, and this is quite interesting. So in Singapore, they don't have any issues with uh, the broadband connection because all they have internet penetration is quite high, everyone got internet. But they do use the TY space for, for another purpose. So we found that they try to open a new business model for the niche market, like for example, uh, at the Garden by the Base, I think everyone might know them. So we use the TY space for the videos, uh, surveillance for securities, and also provide the public Wi-Fi for the touristic. Another touristic space is called Sentosa Island. So they use the TY space for the backhaul links. And then another case uh, at the uh, uh, National University of Singapore and US, they use the device for the IoT purpose, try to use the smart, smart meter links. Then another takeaway is about the technology of barriers. So we found that the bandwidth is quite matters. So from our experiments, the maximum bandwidth that we can get is about 12 megabit per second. Of course, now today is not sufficient for the current internet usage. And also, the point-to-point -point communication is supported by nature's but, uh, but the bandwidth also shares as well. From our experiment, uh, we use uh, the share frequency between uh, M1 and M9, and then the, the bandwidth also cut to half of them, like we got achieved just six megabit per second for each relay. And the reason why, this is my observation. So we found that it could be uh, because of the lacking of incentive. So many, uh, at now today, since TY space is not uh, widely used for many countries, so there's not much variety of the product. The product is still uh, quite expensive to, to buy for the, for the villages. And also, uh, many companies cannot be sustained for that as well, to improve their quality of the equipment. So as we can see, because not, they, they cannot sell a lot of equipment to serve, uh, to, to, to make this technology come to. So and another key takeaway is about policies. So I would like, uh, uh, for this uh, point of view, I would recommend, uh, uh, recommend the article wrote by Steve Song. So he mentioned about 10 years of TY spread about crisis. So uh, this is, uh, they try to summarize, he tried to summarize like uh, what is successful case, like what is, the, uh, what is going on for the TY space during the past 10 years. And we saw that several TY space trials have been carried out worldwide. 
but just but even though uh, engaging with the government sectors and also business sector, but a few of them can be successful to be legal to launch that now today. So only some uh, countries that can be launched at TY space like uh, US, UK, Singapore, and South Africa. And we hopefully uh, we hope that TY space would be come to the place and then try to uh, we can use these uh, TY, these technologies to uh, for another purpose. So in summarize, I would say that so to make this technology come to us, we should uh, integrate it. We consider three factors: one is technical points of view, and also got a policy points of view, and also from the users as well. So for these three factors, if we try to collaborate and somehow we can make uh, this technology come to, and also we can provide opportunities to extend the internet connections uh, to the rural area, which uh, the many users cannot use internet before. And I would like to, uh, yeah, and this is our team uh, from Interlab AIT, and then we also join work uh, with the ICT department from, uh, from AIT as well. And I would like to thank to our sponsors as well, TAG Foundation, for keep supporting us for the Darknet project. And we also would like to thank uh, the NBTC, our Thai regulators. It's not only for the research funding, but they also give us the privilege to use the license as well, which is really uh, crucial for us to run the project. And we also would like to thank the ICTP and also Cambridge for helping us for develop the tools for the spectrum measurement. And then lastly, I would like to thank to Microsoft Research that uh, helping us, supporting us for the equipment for the LTE, uh, LTE small cells. And also, last but not least, I, I would like to thank APNIC as well for the uh, APNIC Fellowship Program because I came here because of this fellowship. So uh, I checked that. So the, the next application deadline is going to be October. So please, if you're interested for this conference, please do join, apply your application for the fellowship. Thank you. Hello, uh, I am Praneet from uh, India and I work in the IoT sector so I can very well relate to the work you are doing and I really appreciate it because uh, till now uh, I have not seen anybody in India utilizing the TV white space although it's so, so available. So I have a question pertaining to the wireless backhaul in Sentosa which you mentioned. Yep. And um, w what kind of... Uh, uh, Backhaul do you use? Do you use a 2G or a 5G? Uh, no, they use the TV white space. Oh, so it's yeah. just one frequency you use? Uh, no, actually the center side is not using bias because I know that they like they have a research team for I Square in Singapore. They try to run some kind of support, uh, launch some project for the Sentosa to provide the the, uh, the backhaul by using the TV. But I'm not sure for the frequency or which frequency that they use. But mm -hmm. should be the same length that we have, like from uh, 470 to uh, 790. That should be the length mm -hmm. that that they use. One of should be one of them. Mm -hmm. An additional comment on that. So I worked on a home assistant product, very similar similar to the Google Home and uh, for the wireless backhaul uh, we experimented with quite a few yeah. but finally had to end up going with the 2.4 gig for the range concerns. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, could, could, you, could you repeat your question because I could not. Uh, uh, what is the backhaul frequency that we use usually? Which one? With the Sentosa one or what? Or Sentosa. The Sentosa. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure which specific frequency that you use but it should be in the length oh, from yeah. uh, 400 to 700. Uh. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Right. We still have about three minutes for questions. Anyone else? All right. If there's no other questions, uh, thank you, Addison, for this interesting presentation. Thank I particularly you. liked your walk antenna. So, a round of applause for Addison. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maz. After white space, we're going to hear about noise. <laughs> wow, it's... So how can I use? Okay, cool. So let's make a start. So this is Yoshinobu Matsaki from IIJ. Um, today I'm going to share uh, my study about the uh, uh, background noise of the internet. So we are sending and receiving packet 
through the internet, right? So yeah, sending is okay, and uh, receiving is okay if it's a part of my communication. But uh, we are receiving something else on the internet, right? Those something else are considered as background noise of the internet, and mostly unwanted traffic. So this study is conducted by Pool Protection Project. Uh, uh, this was uh, started by IIJ and JPNIC to protect um, the free pool, IPv4 pool, uh, from abuse. So we decided to announce the free pool uh, just uh, uh, monitoring the, not, not monitoring, but to protect the, the pool. But uh, by announcing the prefix, we are receiving a lot of packet toward that network, right? So what kind of packet uh, are we receiving? Probably it's just um, scanning, virus spreading, or attacking, or probably just a mistake. Or uh, we have uh, uh, victims in the internet. Uh, they are facing the IP spoofing uh, attack. Then the, the poor uh, victim sending back a uh, thin arc uh, to the, the, the IP spoofed source. That could be us, right? Or just a mistake. So this is a model. The sender is an initiator of the, the packet. So they intentionally sending traffic to us, right? Like scanning, trying to access some port on the, the network here, or reflector. So the, uh, the, the, they are sending a bunch of the uh, packet to uh, the victim over there, like an um, IP spoofed packet, IP spoofed thing, IP spoofed NTP traffic, then the, 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 the victim sending back the, the reply to the source of the packet. And as it's a spoofed, uh, we are receiving such kind of a reflection packet in our network. Yes, we are receiving. But uh, as we just uh, monitoring the, the packet toward our network, so we don't know the actual intent of the packet. So the, the most stories I'm going to share is my guess, right? So the, the only uh, the, the, the fact I can share is we are receiving the, the some amount of the packet on the internet facing host, right? So here I use the 24 hours capturing data. So I just use the TCP dump uh, to capture the incoming the, the packet toward the prefixes we announced. We got about 600 million packets. So it's like uh, 2,700 packets per host per day. Yeah, could be, right? Mostly TCP packet. So same as the, our uh, traffic profile of the internet, right? about 95% uh, of the incoming packet uh, TCP, and UDP, and ICMP, and IP6. And mostly TCP SYN, right? This is a common technique to scan the network, right? Opening services, right? And uh, a few uh, SYN ACK, could be the reflection packet from the victim and some others. The TCP flag variation is interesting. Of course, mostly uh, uh, we had the TCP scheme, but uh, there are a bunch of other combinations as well. Probably those were used for uh, some uh, scanning technique, right? setting the whole bunch of the TCP flag to uh, identify the, the, the uh, target host. Right. So the major destination port was 23, at the TCP 23. No surprise, Telnet, right. 
because we have many IoT devices that um, still using Telnet as a, a, a control channel. And some others, 52869, 8545, 22, right? Pretty common uh, port numbers. And uh, once we have some uh, uh, security hold on the particular port number, yes, we are seeing the uh, spike for that port as well. And the UDP port as well. So this is interesting. About a million uh, sender uh, just sending a few packets, less than 10 packets, to our network, for our network. But uh, a few hosts sending hundreds of millions of packets to our network. Right? That's interesting. So the, the top talkers, so a few hosts sending a lot of packets. So the, the, the top one, Ukrainian IP, sending uh, many packets, <laughs> right? Um, the, 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 all of them are TCP sent to the port numbers, uh, uh, 1025 to uh, 10,000. So they are scanning the, the whole high ports, basically. And USA IP, they are trying to scan the, the uh, particular port number, 52869, and Dutch IP as well. And Hong Kong IP tried to uh, scan some interesting port for them. So they decided to scan uh, only 500 ports per host. Ireland IP, uh, they have eight hosts uh, combined to scan uh, whole our network. They are uh, trying to scan high ports, like uh, uh, 60,000 or 50,000 port numbers, right? But the, 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 the top or the most major destination was port 23. But the, those top talkers are not scanning a port of 23, right? So the, the scanner for those port uh, TCP port 23 is existing the, around there, right? Who are those? They are professional. Security service providers, right? They are providing such a database of open the port number or open the services in your network. So they are systematically scanning entire network. They have a bunch of uh, different hosts around the world, right? So that's why they are existing around the middle. Right? So if we have the, the new uh, such a service provider, we are receiving more. Right. And by scanning you, uh, they are selling the, the service uh, for your benefit. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Many hosts sending a few packets, like a 10 or a 3, right? So I look into the, the, the packet data. So it's, it looks like BitTorrent. Um, so here are some keyword, get underscore peers one. This is a typical packet of BitTorrent to connect or initiate a peer-to-peer -peer network, right? And uh, I found a similar one as well. Probably this one uh, also a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network uh, that I don't understand, but uh, must be. So, but the why do we receive the, such a peer-to-peer uh, -peer packet to our network, even though we don't have nothing there? 
right? There might be a wrong node information in the peer-to-peer -peer network. Right? Based on that information, many hosts sending us the packet, right? Try to connect the node. But why such a wrong node information in the peer-to-peer -peer network? Probably someone made a mistake that the IP setting or configuration of the host, or someone tried to attack the peer-to-peer -peer network by injecting wrong node information. So sometimes the, 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 such a uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, system publishes the, the information, like uh, no, uh, unique node numbers, right? But uh, this number might be indicating the number of peer-to-peer -peer users. So, this is a, a receiver side. So, average was about uh, 2,000 or almost 3,000 packet per host per day. But a few hosts are receiving a lot here, right? This is a log, log scale. So, a few hosts are receiving a lot because of the peer-to-peer -peer wrong node information. As I said, a few ho uh, uh, many hosts sending a few packet toward a particular host in our network based on the wrong node information. That causes such kind of the, the, the interesting uh, distribution. Oh, as I said, I see IP6 packet. So it's a V4 encapsulated IPv6 packet. That's so like this. So someone sending us the, the IP6 packet, searching the, the router uh, of the, the IPv6, right? And then I look up the PTR record of the source, this host. And uh, looks like a HTTP server, so www.134.cs.uic.edu. University host sending the IP6 packet to us. Huh, okay, let's access the website. And this explains that. So they are trying to um, scan either top or uh, router on the internet. So that's why they are sending a bunch of the IP6 packet towards the IPv4 host. And this is interesting, 624 packet. As you probably you are aware, this is a Google, right? By uh, IPv6 address, you can tell. So Google 443, it's a HTTPS, and then sending back a uh, 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 SYNC to uh, the 624 host. But uh, it's not there. Because the, the, the V4 address uh, using in this R624 packet is ours, right? So someone tried to access Google by using 624 address, but as they somehow mistake or part of the attack, I don't know. That's why the Google sending back SYNAC to the 624 relay, the relay sending us the, the, the target. Right? 
I don't know what actually happened, but uh, this is, could be that scenario. Maybe it's a configuration error, someone using the, our uh, public IP in the network, and uh, somehow uh, as they don't have a, a public IPv6, the host decided to use 624. Or someone using 624 space for IPv6 seen flooding. We also observed the interesting traffic about 300 MBBS traffic to the single destination on uh, November last year. So many sources from different countries and economies. There was a whole UDP, random source and destination port, but uh, they all said don't fragment bit, and they all uh, had the, the same uh, packet length. Hmm. Maybe peer-to-peer, -peer. I don't know. But uh, it looks strange for me. I couldn't feel that the intent of the communication from the packet. It's just my feeling, so I cannot uh, tell uh, why. So I decided to count of the byte distribution of the, of the packet, right? By counting by distribution, sometimes you can tell the, the, the data profile, right? Like a PDF or a document file, the zip file, or media file, right? So here's the result. Flat. That means the data was totally random totally random, right? So I can say there was no intention for communication. So, okay, I suppose this was a DDoS attack, but the, we don't have any service there. That's strange. So someone tried to run the, the, the attack toward uh, nothing. <laughs> or just a mistake. And uh, I got an, another attack on this April. 400 mega BPS to a single host, but a different uh, attack profile. So it's not a single case. We ha I have uh, several cases of the attack profile or attack traffic toward the nothing. So non-unused IP space. So without any particular reason, sometimes you suddenly become a target of TOS. That's, that's the internet, <laughs> right? Um, there was um, this kind of the packet as well, right? So the single packet contains this kind of the shell script style data in it. So trying to fetch uh, data from the internet and then try to execute, right? So be careful about your product you have at home or uh, in your office network uh, facing the internet. If uh, those have the, 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 some security hole, People are trying to exploit it. So we have background noise in the internet, IPv4, I mean. And I got a bunch of the scanning towards the, 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 the space. Yes, of course, as we expected. And the security service providers are also scanning you for your benefit or their benefit. And if you are unlucky, you might receive many packets without any particular reason. So it might be your customers, might be your router. So sometimes our, our management uh, ask us the reason of the, the, the attack, right? They ask us to explain that. Yeah, you can tell 
Yeah, probably just a mistake. We have a case. We have cases of the, the DOS attack to unused space. So that's my talk. Um, that's my sharing. Um, thank you very much. Uh, that's a quite a short one. Any questions? We have about 10 minutes for questions. So please line up to the microphone if you've got questions. I think I see John running to the microphone. Yep. Have you thought that maybe bit flipping is responsible for some of the background noise? <laughs> Sorry. Someone shouting Could out, be. cosmic rays. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Karan, and I'm a fellow, and I belong to AIT. Uh, my question is, how hard is it to mitigate real-time this kind of attacks? Because it's supposedly random, right? But how do you, like, is it in a way to differentiate? Like, from an ISP or any, like, network system point of view, how easy or difficult might it be to mitigate? Because if the bandwidth is there, but if it's not for a genuine purpose or, like, genuine... So you want to mitigate an attack toward your... Yeah, like, oops, last end user, like, as you said, you have seen the peaks for random... Uh, probably you can have the, the net flow um, analysis plus some uh, mitigation product as well. Okay, okay. Right. Like, uh, usually it's not automatic or something like, is like, these kind of attacks are usually not automatically uh, mitigated. Like mm -hmm. you, you need you need like third party tools. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, of course, um, it's up to the attacker or what kind of the, the technique or attack profile uh, to target you, right? So, uh, first you need to um, detect that by yourself. Um, Netflow or. or IPFIX is a friend to detect uh, those kinds of the, uh, anomaly traffic toward your network. And from there, you need to distinguish uh, between the normal or actual communication traffic and the malicious traffic. That's a tough part. Um, sometimes the Windows update uh, <laughs> trigger the, the huge traffic toward your network as well, right? Hi, Mark van Santen from Greenhost. Um, I was um, um, uh, working with a very similar project on the side, and we had a problem that we uh, needed a lot of resources to process and store all the data. Um, and I guess that you have much more data than we had. Can you explain a little bit about your setup and how you stored all the data and made the analysis? Yeah, currently, we, um, this is not the, the original intention of the project. So we just uh, wanted to protect our free pool. Then uh, as it's uh, interesting, so we just decided to capture the whole data to the, the uh, announced space. And uh, to have the real-time monitoring, of course, you need a huge storage and uh, processor uh, processing the performance. So, uh, that's why I decided to uh, use the one day, uh, particular one day data for analysis. Um, otherwise, you need the, the uh, proper database to store your uh, the packet to your network. So, probably it's another project, right? Thank you very much. Hi, Aftab Siddiqui. Um, Maz, uh, uh, Good idea to protect your mm -hmm. uh, prefixes by announcing it. Well, you can also try creating AS0 ROAS. Uh, yes, uh, we are thinking of that. Uh, so, um, as we have a, a new proposal for the EPINIC uh, to uh, issue our AS0 ROA for those on the free pool, right? But um, still, I'm not uh, sure uh, what kind of the side effect are we going to have. So, yeah, it's a good idea to try. Just, no, no, on a, um, so, um, at least for those who, who, resource holders who own those prefix, I mean, have the custodian of the resources right now, mm -hmm. they can do it, other than this policy, right? So, while you advertise it, that makes sense at the moment, but mm -hmm. if everybody started uh, announcing it, what they hold, 
mm -hmm. is going to create a million prefix quite soon. Yeah, yeah. So, um, second point is, uh, would you like to expand that research further uh, and say how, how long you do this research and and how you collect it from different vantage points rather than from just Japan and see if it is some localized data which is not reaching Japan, uh, maybe hitting Europe or US mm -hmm. or somewhere else? Currently, uh, we don't have any particular uh, plan, but um, I'm thinking to have uh, some beacon project, uh, similar to the beacon project. Um, probably we can set an uh, issuer uh, S0 ROA for particular prefix, and then uh, reissue the, uh, another uh, ROA for the same uh, prefix to see the, the side effect or effect with the S0 ROA. Okay, perfect. Hello. Um I am Praneet from India, mm -hmm. and uh, I just have a curious question. Uh, so uh, in your current deployment, uh, in your practical experience, how much packet loss have you seen in real-time networks with the current implementations? So uh, so average is like a 3,000 packet per host per day. So those are mostly TCP thing. You can calculate the, the traffic, yeah. right, from yeah. there. This is the average. Uh, and how much is the packet loss? Flows. Packet loss, Like 5%, 10%, I usually observe 10% loss, so. <laughs> um, as we are just capturing the incoming traffic mm -hmm. and uh, each individual packet is uh, just in one way, right? So we don't have any flow just a single pocket. So each single pocket is the one flow, right? Mm -hmm. Did I get your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So about 3,000 flow per host per day. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. All right. We have about five minutes left, but it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So I will thank Maz. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that insightful presentation. Thank you. Uh, round of applause, please. Thank you, Baz. And our final speaker in this session is Jeff, who's making his way to the stage. And Jeff is going to talk about detecting BGP anomalies. So. And you've got five minutes extra, Jeff. <laughs> Got a little stage here. How weird. Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Houston. I'm with AP Nick. Um, this is not a 35 minute talk, so you know I'll let you out of school early. Um, it's actually a talk about some work that we've been doing over some years as a quiet piece of background work, um, looking at BGP. There are kind of two prevailing attitudes to the screaming car wreck that is BGP and its phenomenal insecurity. Um, one is the ever-present view, we can fix it. After approximately 30 years, I don't know about you, but I'm beginning to lose heart. I actually don't think it's a fixable car wreck. Um, any massively distributed system that relies on the propagation of rumours where every part of that propagation can be altered on a hop-by-hop -hop basis, if you believe that you can secure that and every aspect of its operation, both withdrawals and updates, then I would love to hear what your answer is because you'd be the first in 30 years to come up with something that's credible doesn't mean it's not there, 
But what it does mean after so long is this is a really hard problem. There is another way of looking at this problem, and it's a bit like the fire brigade. If you keep on making houses that burn, we'll set up a fire brigade to put them out when they're burning. We can't stop you trying to burn down your house, but we can stop the mess afterwards being as bad. We can try and put it out quickly. And in some ways, I actually have more faith in terms of being able to contain this issue by saying, well, can we detect anomalies quickly? Can we actually find out when problems occur so that we can enlist some help? Because I do not believe such a massively distributed system that relies on a distance vector protocol can actually have the necessary cryptographic elements to make it impossible to lie. Impossible to lie. I don't believe that's the thing that works. So this is actually about the counter view. If we can't make it impervious to lies, what can we do about trying to detect when it lies? So this is sort of the uber statement here about what we're trying to do. No one reads every BGP update. Or if anyone does, I'd love to meet them because, you know, that's a weird life. Um, so I've got to set my computer off to this. And the whole idea is to process these, these updates in real time and try and figure out automatically within the algorithm itself what is normal, what is not. And that's really challenge, bit challenging because Quite frankly, your professionals out there in setting up BGP, you do such a wacko job as you're living. Things that I would regard as being grievous anomalies and absolute contraventions of the protocol, you guys think are normal. What's that AS path doing? Oh, no, no, no. I'm just AS poisoning in order to do traffic engineering. Why have you prepended 30 times? Well, to see what would happen. These are deliberate things and they're not actually bad, they're quite normal because that's the way you do this. So what's abnormal? What's the lie in amongst all that weird behaviour that you seem to think is fun? Um, there are a number of generic ways of doing this and, you know, over 30 years we've seen a lot of them. Um, God, this is such a small stage. One of them is that I actually do very little. You tell me what's normal, and I'll look at the update feed, and when I see an update that doesn't match your rules, I'll tell you it's an anomaly. So here's an example. AS131. Oh, thank you. God. Such a small stage. Um, I feel better now. Uh, my AS, uh, 131072, and for those of you who remember the dot notation, that's 2.0. Um, I put a rule in, and I say, well, if I originate 192.0.224 or 2001.db8, and the next top AS is 4608, and there's nothing downstream, that's normal. Any other use of that AS is bad. And so here's two updates. Uh, I see an update where an announcement of 192.0.224, the path is 4608.4777 and then me, and that kind of matches the, up, the, uh, the uh, rule set. Actually, it doesn't. What's 4777 doing there? Um, so I'll believe it. It's good. The next one is almost the same, except the originating AS is 4777. That's wrong. So you kind of go, well, this is really, really easy. Yes? Who added that rule set? Me or you? Are you doing it to get you to trigger when your attack is successful? Or is it me, if you will, telling the truth? And so part of this problem is when you create these rule-based systems with alarms, you have no way of knowing who is giving you the rule and whether the rule's even true or not. And where's the truth inside routing policy? It's your policy, it's not my policy. And how do I know who you are? 
You might claim that you're AS3. I have no knowledge of whether you, you are or not. So all of these rule-based systems kind of suffer from the problem of this lack of authority. I can write down these rules, but do I have, is that my AS I am talking about, and is that all of my policy? So really easy to build these systems, in fact, phenomenally simple to build them, but garbage in, garbage out. You have no idea if they're helpful or not, because if people are just putting in any old rule they happen to think about yesterday, then the thing alarms off, whoa, whoa, whoop, 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 got an anomaly, and you just have no idea what it is. Let me dispose of these glasses. I'm getting there. Um, machine learning. I don't know. There's a huge amount of computing sins and transgressions encompassed by those innocent two words, machine learning. And, and in general, if you're a research funding agency, you're used to hearing this, that and the word blockchain. Um, and if you apply for research grants, you're used to using these words and blockchain because that's what gets you money. But on the whole, I'm not a big fan of this. I'm like, if you actually strip apart what most of this machine-based learning means, you do some kind of n-dimensional uh, parametric analysis. How long is the AS path? That's a parameter. Length of AS path. What's the size of the prefix? That's a parameter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then, in some n-dimensional space, you do some relatively simple mathematical cluster analysis. Hell, you don't need to understand it, just feed it into a cluster tool. There are lots of them around. And the theory goes that if you get your parameter right, all the outliers naturally group themselves going, hey, I'm a lie. Now, I believe in unicorns as well, and I believe in all kinds of things, including Father Christmas and the Easter Bunny, so I think this will work just fantastically. It won't, will it? Because in general, what's normal and what's odd in BGP tend to cluster together. And that the subtleties of what is wrong are often so subtle that any of these kinds of machine learning techniques just won't work. So, you know, good luck to you and you will get funding. Let me promise you those are very good keywords in a funding proposal, but if you actually want something useful, eh, I'm not a big fan. Um, so you're left with the brute force approach and it is really, really hard. It is just straight brute force. Um, you feed the updates into an analyzer and you have a whole bunch of rules that try and say what is normal and you use thresholds to pick out the candidates. Now you go, well, why so hard? And part of the problem is you use BGP for two reasons. You use it for reachability. Here's my prefix. Please come down whatever path to send packets to me. Great. But what you also do is you play with announcements in order to do traffic engineering. Here is my slash 16. Oh, and by the way, here's a slash 24. I'm advertising it out the left because I want some amount of traffic to come in through circuit A. Oh, and here's a few slash 20s and I'm going to advertise it for two hours on a Tuesday because I want that traffic to come in through circuit B. I'm going to change the origin AS of this particular prefix in order to bias the way traffic selection works. I'm going to do some AS path poisoning and so on and so forth. And if you really do need to do traffic engineering, Anything you can do in BGP is fair game. And from the outside, it looks wacko. It looks completely wacko. So what you have to do inside these sort of heuristic systems is to try and filter out the noise from the signal. So problem is, BGP is a protocol that dates back to the Bellman Ford algorithm of 1963. It's older than the moonshot. You know, it's getting on to 60 years. Um, distance vector protocols work by truth through exhaustion. Because the way they work is that I'll tell you my best path, you tell all your neighbours your best path, we tell their best paths, and the best paths go circulating around the room until everyone's got nothing more to say. And at that point, in theory, everyone has a best path to everywhere else. And it is just phenomenally chatty. If you ever look at the way BGP updates work, you will see a huge amount of just repeats of information because that's the way these things work. By the way, OSPF, 
and ISIS are completely different. These shortest path first protocols are much more economical in what they send as updates because they just flood the link state. This link up, this link down, and that's all they do. Everyone's expected to compute the entire topology. BGP, you're not expected to compute anything, right? It's just simply truth through exhaustion. Um, so because it's exhaustion, you'll actually find there are transient states in BGP that are unstable. I'm advertising a route to you, 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 and you on the front bench, right? And then you send it to your neighbours on the row behind, you send it to your neighbours on the row behind, right? So good. I withdraw and Maz is right onto it like a shot. He propagates the withdrawal, but the rest of you haven't. And so what you see is in the second bench, those of you who are relying on Maz immediately rely on someone else and send updates. So what you find in a large complex BGP mesh is the withdrawals and the updates tend to struggle against each other. And a single update event at source might become 20 updates and then a withdrawal. So BGP is incredibly noisy and incredibly unstable. Now spot the anomaly. And don't forget too that the best attack lasts for 15 seconds. The best attack is so fast you don't even notice it. So you're trying to detect fast running, rapidly moving anomalies inside an environment that generates by default fast running, rapidly moving anomalies. So it's a challenge. Um, the other thing about BGP uh, and BGP security is we have no idea why BGP works the way it does. Absolutely none. So I put up this graph here because there are a couple of things here which are just so wrong, it's not funny. And this is anti-gravity. This is the period since 2009 to, I don't know, a month or two ago, 2019. And the orange line is the number of prefixes inside the V4 routing space. It went from 300,000 to 750,000. In a distance vector algorithm, the number of updates to converge should be roughly the square of the number of participants. So as the network gets bigger, it should get dramatically less stable. And this is what we said to ourselves back in, ooh, 1995, BGP is going to melt. And in theory, we were so right it wasn't funny. In practice, we couldn't have been more wrong. Because that next graph, the blue, is the number of updates. Why, for almost four years, did the number of updates actually slowly go down, not up, even when the number of routes went up? That's just wrong. Even now, as it's risen, it's risen nowhere near as fast as the number of entries. Why? And if you think that's weird, surely withdrawals of a route should be based on the size of the topology, how many things are being routed. The bottom line is the number of withdrawals. So, I'm sorry, this is so wrong. Why, despite the size of the table growing, are the number of updates between 150,000 and 200,000 per day? No one can answer it, right? I can't either. PhD for anyone who can. Um, and the second one, part B of your thesis, why is the number of withdrawals rock steady at 10,000 a day forever? It just is. I'm like, do you all queue up? I'm sorry, you're allowed to withdraw, you're not. Again, this is just all wrong. And that's so stable. It's just that's the way it works. Now, if we can't understand that, it gets very hard to understand where the anomaly lies. So, okay, let's do the next thing. All of these updates, do they tell you new information or are they just a repeat of old information? What's the new content in BGP updates? So, I looked at the last, ooh, 10 years of data and looked at, for every day, how many prefixes had never been seen before versus the number of prefixes that were inside the rib every single day. And so this has got two scales. The one on the left, same one as before, 
300,000 to just getting close to 800,000 prefixes in the RIP. This is cool. But look at the scale on the right. Zero, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And this is the absolutely new prefixes per day. That's a leak. 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 So you can see some patterns emerging of anomalous behaviour, but the rest is weird. We only ever see two to three hundred new prefixes a day, irrespective of the size of the table. You shouldn't be able to say that. Bigger table, more activity, more prefixes. One would have thought, but no, it's not what's going on. V6 is different. No, it's not. It's the same kind of thing. The table is growing exponentially. Only five to ten new prefixes a day, but look at some of that noise rate. There is ample evidence in that graph to suggest that there are far more route leaks, policy violations, in six than in four. Now, they're not big, 100, 200 routes, but because it's V6, there's one thing we all know about V6. Nobody's looking, and nobody cares, because it's V6. Um, moving on, let's talk about topology. Now, trying to do a measure of the whole network doesn't really make a lot of sense. But what we can do is look at the adjacencies. If I'm peering with Geordie, we're an adjacency. And when I see an AS path with Jeff, then Geordie, let's count that as an adjacency. And you can count the number of adjacencies inside the network. It's kind of a count of connectivity. And that red line goes from 45,000 back in 2009 to 110,000 today. It's kind of doubled, and it's kind of doubled at the same rate of ASs. What does that say? Give a prize for the best answer. Any takers? So close. So close. Connectivity is not getting richer. It's the star type topology where everyone just has one connection into the core. Because as you add a new AS, you add one new pair. You don't add three pairs. So multi-homing isn't actually a big feature inside this network. A lot of networks come up just singly connected here. So close. See if we can get you a t-shirt. AP Nick folk, can we do that? Um, <laughs> hope someone's listening. Have a look, too, at the number of new adjacencies per day in V4. It's actually quite a lot. It's actually quite a lot. So that what we're seeing is around 100 new adjacencies a day. Hard to say why at this point, but it is information. Because what it's saying is, out of the 150,000 updates a day, I only saw 100 information events about topology. The other 49,990 up, 900 updates told me nothing I didn't already know. And if I'm looking for anomalies, it's only those 100 that I'm really interested in. Because if you've let something go on for a year, I don't believe a hijack lasts a year. I think you've lost that prefix, goodbye. Because if you haven't reacted in a year, I'm sorry, it's gone. Um, V6, so let me go back again. 100 a day, wasn't it? I pressed the back button. Oh, there it is. There's the back button. And here's the forward button. V6, it's a very similar kind of pattern. Uh, 30 new adjacencies of ASs per day. And this is interesting. You notice that that curve is slightly more hook-shaped. So what that tends to suggest to me is there's no clear core in V6, that the number of new ASs start to visibly multi-connect inside the BGP space. Now, it's not pronounced, and it'll probably flatten off, because ultimately, it's just topology. It's not a protocol difference. So we're now starting to get some clues about trying to look for anomalies. And I have lots of time. Um, <laughs> BGP updates are basically boring as batshit, because they tell you nothing you didn't already know. They just repeat the same old information. The new information is small. And it doesn't matter how big the size of the routing table is. It's scale-free. So if we're looking for anomalies, maybe we should look for prefixes I've never seen before 
and AS paths that have adjacencies that I've never seen before. And maybe that might give us a clue about when folk are trying to be ultra-inventive in BGP and telling you lies. So, here's an approach. For every prefix, do what happens inside your router. Load it into a context tree. So if you see a slash 24 and there's the covering slash 20, note the fact that you're covered by a covering aggregate. Load up the whole thing into a tree that gives you basically the hierarchy of specifics and aggregates. Analyze the path for adjacencies. Don't worry about the whole path, it really doesn't matter. And strip out the duplicates, because duplicates, are, you know, the padding's just padding. But look at the ordered adjacencies. If you see AS1 followed by AS2, that's different to AS2 followed by AS1. And do the typical analysis that we all did. Lesion Gao, I think, did this back in oh, the year dot. Um, if you look at a whole bunch of AS paths, you can figure out who's the provider and who's the customer. Do that. Do the whole provider-peer relationship thing. Um, get a geolocation database. You can spend a lot of time, money, and effort building one of these. It's perfect, and Google has, and you know, a whole bunch of folk have done this. I'm cheap as hell. I use MaxMind. Um, it's basically okay. The bits that don't work, okay, are annoying, but you know, it's, it's free. Uh, geolocate the prefix in the originating AS. Understand which, even just coarsely, which country each of these things are meant to be in. Go and check rowers, because rowers are a strong clue that was what the intent was. And if you can figure out the, the seething mess of contradictions that is the IRR in aggregate, which is a mix of lies, half-truths, evasions, and the grain of truth, uh, go, you can go and use that too. I'm not sure how to do that yet, but hopefully someone will enlighten me. Out of all of that, you should be able to figure out what's interesting. Um, if a customer leaks a route to another provider, that's a valley. If you think the customer-provider relationship is, is up going down, then if you see a path that goes down and then back up again, that person at the bottom is leaking. So if an AS path contains a valley, that's an interesting update. Um, if I always see AS1 followed by AS2 everywhere, and you give me an update that has AS2 followed by AS1, that's really interesting. And I think that's odd. I'm not sure, but it's interesting. The AS is in unusual places. Um, if I've never seen that prefix before, that's really odd. If I haven't seen that AS before, that's really odd. Odd insofar as it may not necessarily be an anomaly, but it's certainly not information I've seen before. Um, and now I start to look at specifics and aggregates. Because most of the time, if you're traffic engineering and doing more specifics and aggregates with different paths, everything goes back to the same AS, right? Only in very unusual circumstances are you hole punching, where I'm trying to take out of your slash 16 a 24 and route it over here. Now, you might be aware that I've just done that and given your permission, but it's more likely you haven't, and it's more likely I'm playing fast and loose. So where you see specifics or aggregates where the origin ASs differ, you should pay more attention to it. Um, the other thing, too, is where the more specifics and the aggregates differ in geolocation, that the aggregate actually covers a variety of geographies. There are a few providers with such aggregates, Liberty Global in Europe, for example, and there are a few folk like Facebook who just put everything in Ireland because they can, but on the whole, that's not common. So when you see these synthetic aggregates that span a multiple number of economies, you should watch out. That looks a bit weird. And similarly, where the prefix and the originating AS tend to geolocate to different places, that's just odd. And last and not least, how long does a good hijack last? A really good hijack is 15 seconds. A moderate hijack, Ether Wallet in Brazil, how long did that last? Two hours. Anything that lasts for a day is probably true. Isn't it? I'm like, someone will notice, someone will fix it. So in general, Short-lived announcements are much, much more interesting in some ways than stuff that just goes on for days because the victim will notice. And, and after days, you can expect someone to have noticed it. So if you're looking for anomalies, look for the stuff that happens quickly, not the stuff that just drags on and on and on. Um, 
RPKI and the IRR. I like the RPKI for this because there's a much more positive currency here. It's very hard to put old inaccurate crap inside RPKI because you don't have the keys for it. Uh, on the other hand, for IRR, nee, who knows, who cares? Um, IRRs are very confusing. So the things that I think are interesting, the RPKI gives me an interest filter. IRR gives me a mm, better than nothing. And more specific floods are always interesting in terms of anomalies. So what am I doing? I'm trying to build this. Um, what am I using? I'm using C because, quite frankly, I am sick and tired of fashionable languages. Um, all of you hopefully know C. If you know anything else, that's great, but you always know C. Um, I want to do a generic design that basically copes with feeds from a whole bunch of speakers. Um, I actually want to just talk raw BGP, uh, not even uh, BGP, uh, MRT or any of the others, BMP. Um, and the way I want to do this is actually use plug-in filter sets. So the architecture should look a little bit like this. That you take in a feed, you throw it through a model of a rib that does more specifics and aggregates and does geolocation so it understands, in theory, approximately where these things were meant to come from. And then you just apply filters to what you see in that model. So you can filter that information about, you know, is it conformant with the RPKI, the rowers that are out there, or is it ringing big bells about invalidity? Is it conformant with an IRR or not? Well, who cares? Uh, do you do AS valleys? Do I see that? Do I see more specifics? I have in a whole bunch of rules that just put a filter on what goes through that model. And in theory, it can take the 150,000 updates a day, drop that down to around two or 300 that look interesting, and then try and figure out the four or five that might actually be something real. Because I actually don't think the malicious amount of anomalies is anywhere near thousands a day. There's a certain amount of mistake, I'll go about 30 or 40, and a certain amount of malicious intent, two or three, a couple of times a week, if you're lucky. And that's what I'd like to hone in on, rather than say, here's a thousand events that happened, go figure. Um, how should I report? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. I'm not a UI kind of person. Um, so the standard response is when you're not a UI kind of person is just put everything in JSON and hope that someone else can figure it out. And, and you know, I'm happy with that because I don't care. Uh, web archives, links into RipeStat, other report formats, meh. I suppose if you do JSON, everything else gets solved, right? This is my theory. Uh, so where am I? On the other end of that hole. Um, <laughs> deep inside trying to figure out how to do this with sort of a minimal amount of effort and a maximal amount of return. And, and so it is just right now work in progress. But I, I'd like to think that this idea of looking for novelty and trying to look for things I've never seen before tend to give us more of a lever than a lot of the other detectors out there. Um, you can help. <laughs> Sooner or later you can really help, but right now I am interested in a few EBGP feeds from a few large-scale tier one default-free zones in order to sort of richen up this, the data set I've got. I'm currently using a small number of feeds, very small, coming basically out of APNIC. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to talk to anyone who's got a BGP feed, a multi-hop BGP feed they'd like to offer, uh, but I only want a few. So, you know, if you're running default-free cores and you think you're interesting, let's have a talk. Later on, I'll be ready to publish code on GitHub as usual and, you know, knock yourself out. Um, and if you're really lucky and I still feel motivated, meh, I might do a subscription service. But I'm actually not sure about this. I'm not sure about it. What I don't want is a service that lets you tell whether your route hijack attempt worked or not. I don't want to be the success beacon, right? So, like I said, I'm worried about that third bullet. I really don't want to be, yes, it worked, because this tool said it worked. So, yeah, I've got to think about that some more. Uh, and a general BGP anomaly feed has much the same kind of issues. So that's the current sort of state of thinking. Um, why are we doing this in APNIC? We're not the routing police. Don't mistake us for the routing police. We don't even play it on TV. Routing is your shared problem. As APNIC, we're not the police here. But we, like you, have an interest in the same outcome. And that's kind of a secure and stable routing system with genuine addresses, not just stuff you made up yesterday. So we'd like to help you as network operators in deploying some of our resources and tools and thinking to make your job a little easier too, much the same as Job Snyder's told you earlier today. 
And so we're interested, from our point of view, in trying to see if the internet's getting better or worse. If this whole issue of, of anomalies is actually something that we're getting a grip on after 30 years, or not, which is probably more likely. I'm so close. You've got four minutes for questions. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions? Hi, Anurag Bhartia from Hiking Electric. Uh, amusing talk. AS6939, as I recall. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, you mentioned a couple of times about geolocation of the, of the prefixes in your talk. How would you geolocate? Max Mind, because I'm a cheap bastard, and I just wanted something that would highlight anomalies. In my reckoning, in looking at better databases over the shoulders of others from time to time, it's about 95% accurate, and the other 5%, it's not. Um, but that won't cover the cases where someone is leaking a downstream, uh, someone is leaking a peer, not possibly downstream, someone is leaking a peer which they are not supposed to in a different region, your BGP anomaly detection rule wouldn't want to work unless you end up in tracing to those, which again won't scale up if you start tracing to individual yeah, prefixes. The, the whole approach was kind of the preponderance of evidence. And so you do a number of rules going, well, that's a plus one, that's a plus 20, that's a minus two. And what you're trying to do is to get to the point where the preponderance of evidence indicates that's interesting. Whereas any single test doesn't really give you any conclusive data at all. Right. It's just, oh yeah. So this is why I'm prepared to go, there is some evidence that if you see this anomalous leaking, it looks more interesting than not, but it's not necessarily the final answer. So my response to you is, you're probably right. It's a plus one. And if the threshold is 10, you need a few more clues to get there. Right. And the other part about the rule detection, maybe you might consider having, uh, it's quite a known case of the number of ASNs in the default free zone. So you may have a rule where if you see multiple ASNs, if you see more than two ASNs in, in, in a given AS path from the default free zone, it is expected to be a possible route leak scenario. More than two? ASNs. So you should not have more than two default free zone ASNs in a given ASP. Oh, so, so basically what you're saying is I should not see <coughs> a plateau in the valley free zone of more than two players. That's, yes. a, that's a rule. Yes. In the same way as valley free, the peaks are either one or two. It's okay. either a peak or it's a peer. You can never have three because right. that's a leak. Right. Yeah. Okay. Part covered in rule. Makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Pavel from AIT. Uh, so, according to my understanding of BGP, uh, it means it's, uh, it runs on a single path, and although there are mechanisms like ECMP, it's still a single network. And BGP multipath can be used, but not across multiple ASS. So, as someone who's doing research on NDN, name data networking, can BGP run on NDN? And if so, does the BGP, can the BGP multipath be used across multiple ASS due to NDN? Now, I don't know what that question means of can BGP run on this hypothetical name data networking network? Yeah. Don't understand the question. What I do understand is if you had a distance vector protocol algorithm that tried to do a topology that routed names, not IP address prefixes, could you use BGP to do that? Yeah. I think the basic answer is yes, right? But, you know, let's understand a few limitations about distance vector algorithms and let's go even deeper and get into this whole issue of segment routing and what load balancing and traffic engineering is all about. When you want more than best path and you want to load your network evenly, you need to understand how your network is being loaded in order to place the next packet on, if you will, the best path in terms of load. So you need a feedback system. Now, if it's all your network, your Google, your Facebook, your you, you can probably customize a protocol that understands the dynamics of your network and do multiple path loading evenly using feedback that you control. If we're trying to route the lot of you and you've all got your own policies and I'm trying to load balance across all of that with feedback, 
It ain't going to work. It's as simple as that. It is not going to work. We don't understand feedback at that kind of scale across that kind of different environments. Hell, the only reason why we use BGP in the inter-AS space is that metrics don't work across providers. Your metric is, you know, one is biggest bandwidth, low is, is you know, minimal. Whereas my metric is one is more cost, low is cheap. You can't put the two together. So what you can do inside your AS, knock yourself out. What you do in the inter-AS space is really primitive. You just bang the rocks together. Equal cost, you've got to be joking. Okay, yeah. thank okay. you. We are out of time. Don't run away, Jeff. Um, thank Maz, you. Addison, we have gifts for you. Thank you. Oh, uh, that gentleman there needs a gift. Which gentleman? <laughs> the, one that, the only one that attempted the question. Oh, the only one who attempted a question. <laughs> no one else gets a gift. Well, <laughs> you're all failed. <laughs> See if I can find one. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I have a gift for you. Oh, thank you. Yes. Maz, would you like a gift? Addison, would you like a gift? <laughs> I'm not going to throw it at you. There you go. I want for you as well. Uh, I've got a spare, I think. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we now have a tea break. Thank you.